There are few awards that represent a sport as well as championship belts represent the world of competitive wrestling. And what's even more impressive is that they've been doing that for more than 200 years. So that is what we're going to talk about today. From intricate handiwork to harsh metal forging, this is how wrestling championship belts are made. The World of Belt Makers Now many of you may think that since wrestling as a sport is so brutal, the process of making the belts would also be similarly industrial, with a ton of machinery and hard work. The reality of the matter is that as impressive as they look on stage, the actual making of belts is more similar to jewelry making than anything else. In fact, the process is so detailed and takes so long to learn that there are only a handful of belt makers in the United States, with each of them being a master of their craft. And it is here that the belt making process starts as the wrestling agencies contact these artists with their demands. And once they have ironed out the details, the project is handed off completely to the belt maker, who will spend the next weeks or months handcrafting each part of the belt in their shop. But before that long and arduous process can start, there is the topic of designing the belt. It's no secret that championship belt designs are some of the most important images in a championship and will represent a winner and a title for decades to come. So making the right design that represents the title and series is pretty damn important. This is why the artists take a long time to consider all the different facets of a belt and design them slowly. In general, a belt consists of four or six main parts. There is the actual leather belt base, the center plate, which usually has the insignia of the agency, as well as the title name and year, and two or four side plates depending on the size and significance of the belt. These side plates can have anything, from the winner's name to the countries or states the competition took place, engraved on them. Once the designer has decided on the basics of all these parts, they go through a back and forth between them and the agency, trying to finalize all the details and ornaments. And once the two reach a conclusion, they can draft the final sketches and move on to the next step, which is modeling and casting the plates. As important as 2D designs are, they're pretty useless if you can't translate them into 3D. This is why as soon as the sketches are done, the belt makers move on to the basic modeling of the belt design, both to visualize the design in three dimensions and to start working towards a mold that'll be used to create the metal plates. The modeling process consists of a couple of steps. First, soft clay is used to create a highly detailed model by hand before letting it dry and become solid. Once this is done, they can use plaster to form a mold around the clay, which once solidified can be separated from the clay model. This plaster mold is then used to make a soft metal model from something like aluminum or other easy to model alloys. These are the final models before the plates can be cast, so the artist spends a lot of time cleaning out any rough edges and perfecting all the relevant details. And once final, this is used to create a final metal mold that is used to cast the eventual plates out of molten tin. These tin plates are then allowed to completely cool off before they are sent off to the next station, which is refining and detailing. Now, since the plates were cast instead of being carved or forged, there are a lot of rough edges and shallow details in the final product, which is not ideal when you're trying to create one of the most important icons and one of the most important sports in the world. This is why even after they are formed, artists will spend a lot of time working to sharpen all the details of the belt, from carving out the letters and sharpening any designs to polishing all the rough edges and bits of molten metal. The end result of this process is a perfect plate to which any remaining details can be attached. These are things that are impossible to bring across by casting, like sharp letters, sculptures, and any other such small things. These are crafted separately from the main structure before being attached to the base. After this, these undergo the same hand refining process to match their surface to the rest of the tin. And once the belts have been crafted in this way, all that is left to do is electroplating. Now, tin is a heavy and pretty corrosion resistant metal, but it is no match for the looks, protective properties, and most importantly, value of gold or other precious metals. This is why all wrestling belts are thoroughly electroplated with a layer of these metals. 
To do this, the tin plates have to first thoroughly be cleaned to remove any dirt or metal shavings that may interfere with the chemical plating before a rotating buffing wheel is used to hand polish each surface of the plates. These are then allowed to sit in an electrolyte solution with a special chemical composition while being attached to a circuit that slowly deposits a perfect layer of gold or any other metal onto the plates. And for belts that have more than one precious metal on them, the same process is done multiple times while covering separate parts of the tin to achieve a two-tone effect. And once finalized, the belt is as shiny as any piece of fine jewelry. And speaking of jewelry, let's move on to the next step, which is, you guessed it, the final details. Now, the exact way of decorating a belt can differ from competition to competition, designer to designer, and year to year. But in general, a few techniques are always used. One of the simplest ways to add detail to metal that is used to these kinds of belts is etching. For this, a special chemical is added to some parts of the belt, which when submerged in an etching solution, creates a special texture on the metal. A more traditional and simpler method is also to simply paint some parts of the belt. This is done using special enamel paints that last very long and retain their colors. For this, the plates are first cleaned and then roughened to give the paint something to latch onto before enamelers apply the thick paint. After this, the plates are simply baked for a few minutes to solidify the enamel, and voila, you have a bright and lustrous finish. But probably the most famous way of adding detail to these belts is in the form of, you guessed it, gemstones. And this process is pretty self-explanatory. A jeweler is hired to attach precious stones like rubies, sapphires, or even diamonds to the relatively homogeneous surface of the metal before once again allowing it to dry and solidify. And that finishes the plates, which means all that is left is to make the actual belt. Compared to making of the plates, this process is pretty simple. Here, the artist first traces the shape of the belt onto a piece of high-quality leather before using special tools to hand-cut the shape from it. This is then dyed the desired color before being waxed and polished to complete the outer surface. Once that is done, workers move on to the inner lining that is made from spandex or felt to make the belt comfortable to wear on bare skin. These layers are then stitched along with any other leather details before the plates are also attached using either thick leather working string or industrial glue. After this, the worker can add the closing mechanism, whether buckled or hooks, before using high grade vinyl to complete the outer edge of the whole belt. After this, all that is left to do is brand the inside of the belt with the agency and the belt maker's insignia before packing it in a custom box and shipping it off to the halls of wrestling history. Click on any one of the two videos on your screen right now. We'll catch you guys in the next one.